all of the people that uh, are necessary to answer uh, the public's questions. And so first and foremost, the purpose of today's meeting is to have the uh, people who have the answers to your questions, you the citizens of Lawrenceburg, you the citizens of Dearborn County, to gather them into one room and allow your questions to be asked and answered. Um, I, in, in addition to that, and I know there was uh, another story on Eagle today, uh, that this was a published uh, closure plan meeting um, for ELT, that's also true. And so ELT will, will go through some of the things that they originally intended uh, to cover in this meeting. However, once um, there became some information that was disseminated to the public, we uh, knew that it was our responsibility to make sure that all of the information uh, was accurately disseminated to the public. That is our duty uh, as elected officials. Um, and that's our duty to the 5,000 in Lawrenceburg, the 50,000 in Dearborn County, and all of southeastern Indiana. Uh, make no mistake, our water is our most precious commodity, and we work uh, on a daily basis to protect that. And so during the course of tonight's presentation, you'll learn just what that means. Uh, and the good news is you won't have to take my word for it. Um, we were able to, uh, by the efforts of a, a great number of people, uh, again, to whom we are all very grateful, we were able to organize um, a, a great group here that will be able to answer all of your questions. Um, I've circulated an agenda, and um, I'm also thankful to the parties that are here uh, for allowing me to moderate. I felt, uh, and, the ma and Mayor Milan felt, that that was uh, the most appropriate way to uh, handle this meeting because uh, really, this meeting, again, is for you. We're in the audience with you looking up at ELT, Tanner's Creek LLC, looking up at IDEM, and asking the same questions that uh, the public uh, has asked over uh, the last couple weeks. Um, however, this is not a new process, and we've been asking these questions uh, ever since this property transitioned from a power plant to what it is now, which is a property in the midst of being uh, remediated and prepared for hopefully a future use. And just briefly, to go through the history, and, and we've done this before with the fly ash issue, um, but to go through the history, obviously this property that we're talking about is approximately 700 acres uh, located just to the west of us here on the Ohio River within Lawrenceburg proper. And this property served as a power plant um, which began its operation in 1951. And so from 1951 until approximately 2015 when it was decommissioned, this was an active coal-fired power, coal power plant, which means that on site here at, at this location, we were generating power and energy for the region by uh, use of uh, burning coal, and by use of coal energy. Now. The uh, knowledge that I have is very basic in order to uh, assist the, the people I work for, which is uh, the mayor and the administration, but you citizens. Um, these guys have much more in-depth knowledge, um, but essentially there are three uh, ponds and one dry landfill located on the property. And the purpose of those um, uh, locations or uh, holes is to take the uh, boiler sludge, the fly ash, the flue ash that is a natural byproduct of this uh, process and to uh, remove them and store them. And so that's been something that's been going on since the plant opened again in 1951. The, uh, the process I is rather uh, complicated, but in essence, the fly ash, the flue ash is it uh, was taken out of the stacks. It was uh, put into these uh, ponds. It was kept wet, and then it was dried out, and it was placed into the landfill. So that's kind of generally the process when you hear fly ash and flue ash. You hear boiler sludge. You hear about these uh, certain materials. That's what we're talking about. So th these are materials that have been uh, created and stored on this site here since 1951 um, and up until 2015. In 2015, the property was, the power plant itself was decommissioned, and then that property eventually became uh, owned by ELT, CDC, Tanner's Creek, LLC. And, and the folks from that company are here again today to answer your questions. Um, they took over ownership of this property in their capacity as a firm that 
uh, does this for a living that goes uh, in, in, in on site with uh, property that has been used for uh, power plants and, and, and things like this, that uh, sites that need remediation that have potentially harmful materials and uh, remediates them, makes them safe, uh, prepares them for a future use. Um, obviously, as soon as that occurred, so our, uh, our administration, I'm an appointed official, these guys are elected officials, but our administration began uh, two years ago, and so uh, it, it kind of lined up with ELT taking over this property and beginning to remediate it. Um, and from uh, day one, we were uh, very interested in making sure that this project was done in the, the best way, the most appropriate way, and the safest way for our citizens, and to protect the water, to protect the soil, to protect the air. Um, and that has been and always will be our number one concern. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we rely on our ability to um, create a relationship with IDEM. Uh, first and foremost, and so IDEM is the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. They have been tasked by the federal government, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, to monitor all aspects of the activity at the um, power plant site, and they, they have been um, while it was an active site and as it uh, sits now in this remediation process. And one of the, one of the great resources that, that we have is their IDEM's virtual file cabinet where you can look online, you can track um, permits that are applied for, inspections that occur, testing that is done, and these are numbers that speak for themselves. And uh, that's, that's a big emphasis that we have. Again, we don't want you to hear anything from us, we want you to hear from the experts. We want you to hear from the people that are, are tasked by the state government and the federal government to make sure that uh, the environment is safe. So that has been uh, our understanding from the beginning and to that end, we have created, established, and continue to have a strong relationship with IDEM to make sure that this property is being handled in the safest, most responsible way possible. Um, as you all know and as you're aware, uh, ELT uh, has uh, entered into what's called an option contract with Ports of Indiana, which is a uh, part of the state of Indiana's government where the state of Indiana is doing due diligence to inspect this property to determine whether or not the fourth port, there are three ports currently in Indiana, whether or not the fourth port can be built on this property. And the purpose of an option contract is to be able to uh, decide uh, during a period, you know, most often a year, whether or not that sale should be completed and give you uh, the ability to do that without it being sold to someone else. So that's where they are in that process. And to that end, we've kept uh, created, maintained a strong relationship with Ports of Indiana, Governor Eric Holcomb, Governor Holcomb's staff, uh, INDOT, the Indiana Department of Transportation, and really anybody that Mayor Milan has felt could assist us in our goal, which is to make sure that if a port is created here, if, not when, that it is done to the standards and specifications that most benefit the local residents, not the state of Indiana, not the region, but in terms of roads, in terms of the environment, in terms of jobs, in terms of taxes. Uh, we have, Mayor Milan has fought staunchly to make sure that the local voice, the county and the city is, uh, comes first place. W and, he, and he's done that. Uh, I know he's done that because I've seen him do that. I, kn I know that because I've seen him at the drop of a hat drive to Indianapolis to take care of some issues. And we'll talk about that um, later in the program. Again, I just want to give an interview, uh, an overview of uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, that is where we are and that's where we'll remain. Like I said, this is not a new process for us. We started this process two years ago and this process does not end tonight. Um, tonight's purpose is to share information to make sure that the citizens of Lawrenceburg, the citizens of Dearborn County, have accurate information, data about their drinking water. Um, and we will accomplish that goal tonight. We'll make sure that these questions are answered. Um, at, at this point, but however, that will continue. That will continue all the way up until ELT is done with their remediation task to when it is transferred to any other user. And uh, that will be an ongoing process. We will always maintain, our administration and future administrations will always maintain as a pr top priority, uh, c 
caring for the environment and ensuring that the environment is cared for by being active with groups like IDEM. Um, we also have Lawrence Spring Munici Municipal Utilities Director Owen Clawson here. He'll be a part of the program tonight because although um, it is not a requirement, we do test uh, the uh, water um, all over the property and, and how that impacts our general water reserves. The, in the entirety of the city of Lawrenceburg sits on a water aquifer and that water is monitored at all times by local officials like Lawrenceburg Municipal Utilities. Um, it's interacted with by uh, Paul Seymour and his guys over at the Lawrenceburg Conservancy District. It's interacted with and monitored by City of Aurora, City of Greendale, uh, the Dearborn County officials, um, LMS, uh, which is Manchester Sparta, and that's a, a, a utility that we provide services for. Um, so we're always monitoring our water because it is such a, a key asset to us, and it will remain that way. Um, at this point, I do want to turn things over to ELT. Um, and gentlemen, we certainly appreciate you being here today. Uh, as I stated before, the town hall tonight does have another aspect to it where um, ELT does have a closure plan that is currently being reviewed. Part of that is to allow for public comment and I'm encouraged that we have so many members of the public here today to weigh in on that. So with that gentlemen, um, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Good evening. My name is Russ. Is this good? Okay, thank you. My name is Russ Becker, and I'm with um, representing Tanner's Creek Development LLC. And I certainly appreciate you being here. What uh, we have a focus part of the presentation tonight, really, which is um, we'd like to present to you as part of this information meeting, the process that we're undertaking to close one of the ponds that Dell mentioned, which is the fly ash pond. So I'll, I'll go through what we're looking at as part of our agenda. I just wanted to give a brief overview of, our, of our, the Tanner's Creek site, the environmental restoration work that we have underway, as well as a redevelopment plan. A, a brief description of the fly ash pond, which I think is necessary to kind of set the stage. The design of the, of the fly ash pond closure plan, some of the, some of the more uh, eye level design elements that we're, we're working through. Obviously we've got closure construction work in front of us that's important to try to work through that. Post closure obligations, which are, are uh, substantial in, in, in this type of effort. And then the regulatory approval, public, uh, uh, the public comment process that we are now entering into. I want to be clear on where we are in the process, and yet there there's continues to be time, and, and we still have the public comment process in front of us. And then there'll be questions. Um, certainly, anytime I'm through this presentation, if you have questions, I'm fine to try to answer them at the time, or you can wait till the end, either or. I'm good with that. So, um, just to get started on the process here, just a, a little bit of the redevelopment overview. Uh, we purchased this power plant in October 2016, you know, after over 60 years of power plant operations. And, and our plan is, and, and we do this nationally, but to complete deconstruction, demolition of the existing structures and environmental remediation programs for the former power plant site and reposition it, obviously, for its highest and best use. And we mentioned that it's, uh, as mentioned, it's under contract to be purchased by the Ports of Indiana, uh, who intend to obviously invest significant resources into the site. And, th you know, the pictures on the bottom are just obviously 2016 is the power plant, 2017, try to give you just a brief shot of the demolition work, and then 2020 is a conceptual picture of, of what could possibly be uh, as, this, as this moves forward. <coughs> 
a little bit of the timeline so, so everybody gets an understanding of where we are in the process. Obviously, we, we purchased the power plant in October of 2016. The demolition work started in 2017. That work is not complete. We have work that's going to continue through, uh, we think, through 2018. Um, there is still work ahead of us. Some of the major components of that are asbestos abatement of the power plant, which is now complete. We have completed that. The plant structures of demolition, the above, most of the above grade demolition work is complete. And then still yet in front of us is the site cleanup and restoration associated with the deconstruction work. So just give you an understanding that we're in the process, we're in the middle of the process, <coughs> and that's slated to continue um, through the rest of this year. What we also initiated as soon as, um, after we purchased the facility was really, we took a hard look and re redid the engineering work and the design work for the closure of the fly ash pond. So that was first up on, on our uh, engineering work, if you will. That was completed um, through 2017 and the first part of 2018. We've now submitted uh, draft plans, if you will, to Indiana <coughs> Department of Environmental Management and they are, um, We're working through the process to get approval of what we'd like to do. Still ahead of us, in, uh, and we're under in the engineering now, but 2018 through 2020 is the engineering design and closure of some of the other facilities. And I'll show you a picture here, but the main ash pond and the other plant, <coughs> the other plant areas. And then we have engineering design and closure of the ash landfill. And Really, I think most important to try to understand what are the obligations that we took on here is the post-closure monitoring and the maintenance obligations for these closed facilities, which regulatory-wise go on for 30 years. So there's an obligation post-closure to continue to maintain and monitor, and monitoring really focuses on a couple aspects, one of them which is groundwater. So what are we talking about? We have that we tried to just make a color-coded map here of the various features that you're that we're working on that were part of the obligations that were acquired when we acquired this facility that we have an obligation to to remediate and restore. You've got the fly ash pond, which is the major focus tonight. You also have the, the, the ash landfill, the main the main ash ponds and ash ponds which were closer to the to the plant structure itself power plant, there, are, there were some former coal pits, and then we have a slag processing area. So there's a, a portions of this 700 acres, all are part of our ongoing environmental obligations to work through, if you will, a closure process to remediate those sites and make them accessible and in, in shape for redevelopment. The fly ash pond itself, this was originally constructed in 1977 and 78. It's about 69 acres. It's a single impoundment with a perimeter earthen dike. One of the features of this fly ash pond, which is for the, for the period of time, 1977-78, this fly ash pond is lined. And by lined, what that means is there actually is underneath the fly ash itself, they installed a synthetic geomembrane liner, which is about a <coughs> 20 mil, which is about a quarter inch thick liner that basically separates the ash itself from the underlying soil. So this was forward thinking really in 1977, 78, but it is a very important feature. This was in operation till about 2014 to manage uh, fly ash generated at the, uh, the power plant. Some of the elevations which are kind of, it's, it's important, I know everybody here understands this a little bit, that the 100-year the flood elevation is about 488. The dikes, the perimeter dikes are about 515, 520, so about 30 feet above the 100-year flood. The top of the ash surface itself is about 20 feet above the 100-year <coughs> year flood plain. So it is elevated uh, for where it is in terms of uh, the 100-year flood elevation. 
where we are today, we, we've taken on this, this pond, we've dewatered the ash, we've uh, done some regrading to promote surface water runoff to support uh, stability. Uh, all this runoff now is still captured and discharged uh, back through uh, permitted programs according to our uh, the permit requirements and the monitoring obligations. So it's in, a, it's in kind of a intermediate phase here, but that's, we continue to comply with the various monitoring obligations that we have. So the design work, we, question? Sure. It's our understanding that this, the way this is completed, that the perimeter dikes are all clay. The main ash pond itself, the perimeter dikes were raised for bottom supply ash pond. Um, from our understanding of our work, it's all, we are lining, when I get into the lining aspect, we are bringing the liner all the way down across the outside perimeter dikes. There is a portion on the top that has a bottom ash portion of it, but all of this, the extent of the liner goes down and across to the lower dike. You're, you're responsible for closure of the, the, the pond, right? Correct. So I can provide you with a document that will show you very clearly where the bottom ash is at, and I think you're mistaken. The bottom, there's a bottom ash on the top on the upper dike. Yeah, and um, it makes it pretty easy to get this up on it. I mean, that's, that's understanding that the bottom ash is on the upper dike. It's well, this shows, a, this shows a side profile, and you can very clearly see that On the upper dike. The, the liner the liner itself goes to the outer perimeter dike. One, one point of contention, this drawing is now quiet pond, so heavy immunization on that the drawing. Is, that is that may not that includes <laughs> the quiet pond. There's two different drawings there. So it has to be one of both. No, there's one drawing here. There's fly ash labeled and, and the main ash, and this is the main ash pond. Well, there there are, but to the point. To the point. To the point. The the point, point the, the, the the some of the dikes are raised. On camera because I think you're misleading the public. No, that is, there are two there are two diagrams there, and I think that you'll very clearly see that they are not both the main ash pond. <coughs> let let me try to work it this way. The fly ash pond has a lower dike, and then it was built up with an upper dike. The, ex the extent of the lower linum system goes into the lower dike. Everything, all of the ash that was put into this pond is within the linum system. So what you're saying is you had no plans to change the fact that the perimeter was raised after they acquired the new clay. Uh, is here's going to be made of bottom ash? No, here, here's what our plans are. Our capping system is gonna go around the entire top of the fly ash pond, down the perimeter of that upper dike, and tie in beyond the liner with the lower dike. Your closure plan doesn't reflect that? It does. It does. The extent of our liner, extent of our cap is going to go beyond into that, it goes through the existing swale between the two dikes into the outer dike. Okay, well you're on camera, so it's on you. That's fine. So we have, I mean, the engineering work that we went to, obviously we went through a phased approach to control surface water runoff. This was um, in order to be able to close this facility with a construction sequence of, of engineering analysis that were completed, which is slope stability, liquefaction, settlement analysis, cover system stability. These are all 
required elements for a closure plan. All of this has been completed. And then the closure system itself is going to be a multi-layer system. Cover soil six inches, which is, can support vegetation, followed by 30 inches of protective soil, which is three feet in total. And then a drainage layer underneath that. And then an <coughs> underneath that, again, that is, a, it is an impermeable cap. And that's, depending on where we are on, on the system itself, it's going to be a 40 or 60 mil, which is, again, about a quarter inch thick. Yep, go ahead. Sure. Uh, how did, did you uh, take the foundations out? The foundations out? Yeah. Where that's in the, in the deconstruct the demo. Is on one way. Yeah, where yeah. that's part of that work is still coming. I was like, there's a lot of vibration on the ground, and I wonder how that would affect your uh, line and all that. You know, like, you're putting a lot of vibrations in the ground, and it doesn't take much of a whole lot. Part of, this, part of this design work, both with the liquefaction and, and the settlement analysis, deals with that from a seismic standpoint. From a, from a, so all of that, we, we installed within the pond itself a series of, first of all, let me go back to the first part of your question. The liner itself is substantially higher than the groundwater table. When they built this pond, it's substantially higher than the groundwater table. If there's a leak, obviously, in the liner. In the liner itself, sure. If there's a leak, there's a leak. I mean, that's, that's part of our, that'll be part of the post-closure obligation, which I'll get into, where we're going to install groundwater monitoring around the entire facility and, and monitor it for 30 years. Further on, the, when we construct the cap, and, and understanding that the most critical element to the closure, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes, there is. We have an obligation. We have an obligation in front of us. It's called a construction quality assurance quality control plan, which an independent engineer has to oversee the construction and all the lining and all the welding and do all the testing. And then th that has to be done by an independent engineering. And then that becomes part of the closure design report. But the original part of your question, this is one of, that's one of the critical elements of a cap in any type of system like this is to prevent infiltration, further infiltration of water into that ash. And by doing that, then you minimize, obviously, any leakage that'll come out. Do you have vibration from the remediation process will affect that line? I do not. What do you think? How, how thick is that line? The liner is 60 mil liner is about a quarter inch to... A little less than that, but to answer your question, did these specific liners are chosen for use extensively in landfills around the world because they do allow for settlement. Uh, the, the cap that's being used on this particular ash pond is one of the most expensive cap designs that we've had put in place on an ash pond. It's similar to what you see on a municipal landfill. It sees far more settlement and vibrations than this ash pond ever will. It's very overbuilt. So the, the settlement's concerned and things like that, uh, again, they're way overcompensated for. And to address the water, as you brought up in the rest side to address, the cap on top of the landfill will prevent water from getting in. And since there's no longer there water getting into the ash, water will not come out as well. I mean, that's the, that's the art of <coughs> our technology right now. So it's, it's I mean, that's, so 
that's, that's the design we're looking at. You're talking about the complete cap, the extent of the cap, which we, we talked about briefly, is going to run the entire ash pond down the outer upper bank side slope and then beyond the extent of the liner underneath. So it's a full encapsulation. Hey, Russ, if I could interrupt for just a second. Uh, our recording equipment uh, is not able to pick up the audience questions, so if it's okay if we could keep those, and then I'll bring a microphone around and make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask their questions uh, at the conclusion just so it's on microphone so it's being recorded. Sure. trying to present here is just, just a kind of give you an idea of a cross-sectional view, a little bit of close-up of, of what exactly this design that we're intending to install will include. And again, you'll see on this that you've got the top of the ash going from the bottom to the top. You have your impervious 60 mil LLDP is, is, and HDP is high-density polyethylene. Those are line, geomembrane liners. On top of that, to further, um, if there's, to for further move any kind of precipitation or rainwater away from the liner, there, we have to install what's a geocomposite drainage net, which is basically a layer of material that transmits water. So any water that from rainfall that, that infiltrates through the soil hits that drainage layer, and then that is also taken away from the top of the liner. And then you have 36 inches of protective soil, and then we'll vegetate and seed it. Construction work necessary to install a closure cap. Again, the most critical part of this, and all of these documents, this is all the construction quality assurance, quality control plans. These are all part of the plans that have been submitted. But we developed this. this is, implemented for all phases of construction. You, we've got to have independent engineering certification of all the construction work that's done for the closure cap. There's, there's obviously a series of permits that are going to be necessary for sediment erosion control. Well, those will be in place. Cover soil materials, one of the aspects that we're looking at very carefully. We're, we're eliminating as much as possible what the best we can do to get any truck traffic off the roads. We're looking at on-site borrow areas <coughs> for the cover materials to eliminate truck traffic on the highways, truck traffic through the city. And then <coughs> in addition there'll be dust suppression plans for all the phases of construction. Everyone will have the opportunity to ask questions, and not just about the closure plan, uh, but about everything. So if we could just let these guys finish. Um, IDEM will weigh in uh, on what they've heard from the closure plan. We're going to have uh, Lawrence Brigham Municipal Utilities also weigh in. Um, and then everyone will be given an opportunity to ask every question that they have, certainly. D uh, just so we can pick it up on the microphone. Thank you. And, and just to re reiterate, again, the, the, the extent of the closure cap. Another component, this again, a part of the plans that we submitted, which are the post-closure obligations for the, for the uh, closed fly ash pond. And the, these obviously, I think, are a critical component. We have inspection and maintenance activities semi-annual inspections and, ma and monitoring of the cap, looking for gullies, any type of erosion. Uh, we've got a maintenance obligation to mow, repair, removal of any type of sediment or any type of issues that we see associated with the soil cover. And then we, there's a groundwater monitoring program that's going to be put in place post-closure, uh, which is going to include semi-annual <coughs> sampling and analysis of approximately 20 wells. Uh, that number probably, that's a good number to talk with, but sur completely surrounding the fly ash pond. These wells are either existing or the, the majority of these are going to be installed. And the analytical parameter list is really what's required by the Indi Indiana Department of Environmental Management. And the parameter list 
is derived specifically for the material that's stored there, which is fly ash. So you'll be looking predominantly at metals. And then there's an obligation to submit semi-annual reports. And those reports will include a statistical evaluation of the groundwater quality of whether or not <coughs> there's been any, um, any degradation, if you will, of the groundwater quality. No, I don't. I'd prefer if he wants, if he's got a question now, just let him. I think the question that you had is who's going to be taking the groundwater, who's going to be doing the groundwater sampling. That, the groundwater sampling's done by a, by a, typically by a consulting firm, by a certified consulting firm, a geologist, hydrogeologist. There's a, there's a specific process that's necessary in terms of the sampling procedures that has to be followed. And the laboratory work itself is done by <coughs> a certified lab. All paid for by this is Tanner's Creek Development LLC. I didn't say it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll leave that to the cameras. Uh, but it has historically been your employees since AEP has transferred the property, and before that it was AEP employees. Sure. EAG is an in-house consultant. And but isn't, have, that actually, have, isn't that actually your company? Isn't yes. that the same people? Yes. We have, we have certified hydrogeologists. We have, I mean, we've got the professional people that know how to take groundwater samples. That is correct. No further questions with that one. I would like to address that further. Uh, I, work, I work for uh, EAG um, as part of the engineering group. And, and also uh, Tanner's Creek Development LLC and also CDCCO and also at, at all. I work for many companies as a consulting engineer, as every consulting engineer does. Uh, and uh, we do take samples at Tanner's Creek Land Source for Springer Wells. Uh, we take samples at other sites uh, around the country and in Canada uh, from various groundwater monitoring wells and things of that nature. And uh, on this particular site, if, if you've been analyzing the history of what the data has been collected at the wells, it's shown that there hasn't been any statistical variance. Um, if you're implying that the samples were tampered with before they were set to an independent lab, it would show statistical variance. It doesn't show that. Um, as with all of our uh, sampling, it's always done with integrity. And the, we do not sample the uh, we, we pull samples and send them to a lab. We don't actually run the lab analysis ourselves. That's done, always done by an independent lab. And again, there has been no change in those results. Uh, so for anybody to question the integrity of that or if there's any foul play, uh, that has not been shown to date on any of our sites. No, no, I wasn't claiming that you were falsifying the, the water testing. I was pointing out that it was misleading to state that it's a separate company that's doing it when it's just the same people wearing a different hat. And there's really no opportunity for there to be any statistical variance in the testing because the, the monitoring wells are all jammed up against the property, against that landfill, instead of the, the recommended distance because the landfill itself is up against the, the river and Tanner's Creek. So there's, there's no opportunity for those tests to look any different. And the variance, the, the, the simple tests themselves have such variance that it would be impossible to tell any difference. Anybody want to introduce yourself? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I was brought up that I should introduce myself. I'm Adam Peets, I'm a engineer that works for Environlandics Group. And the wells that are installed uh, were not installed by us. They were installed by AEP. So again, we didn't deliberate anything. And they were then installed uh, under the approval of IDEM. 
So again, there was no collusion anywhere. Um, I, I do not appreciate uh, the inference that there is lack of integrity uh, with the company I work for or the companies that I consult for, which are technically separate companies, although we do uh, work for a lot of them as their exclusive consultant. No, no, yes, AEP did put those wells in, and when they did, IDEM did acknowledge that limitation that the wells were too close to ever see any significant difference, but that was as good as they could get. And the question I think that's most important isn't about whether there's a difference upgrading and downgrading, it's the levels that are being shown in the wells themselves. And while those may not be a, uh, a violation themselves, because there is no difference that can be reasonably construed, if those were to appear at the Aurora wellhead, that would be a violation. That, that well would no longer be drinkable. That's the concern that I think everybody needs to understand. There are other monitoring wells in place that monitor closer to those wellheads, and there has not been a violation shown there. The wells that are placed around the landfill are to monitor the landfill, not to monitor the aura wellhead. Right, but we, ha we enjoy the benefit of that early warning system. The, the monitoring wells that are next to our water supply the are early about warning yards system away. you're discussing has not shown a violation. I think that's what everybody needs to know. Yeah. And I would like to move on uh, to something a little more important. Okay, what, what, yeah, we're going to move on to something more important than our water. Thank you. The important thing here is there has not been a violation. As, I've, as we both agreed upon, there has not been a violation. The wells are monitored continuously. They are being monitored by the new owner. They're being monitored. They have been monitored by the old owner, AEP. There's never been a cause for concern shown in these wells. These wells are also common to every landfill installation, almost every landfill installation. They're, they're again, ordinary practices for environmental remediation projects and for capping ash ponds and landfills. The fact that there has been no violation shown should be reassuring. It should not cause you to be concerned about your groundwater. It should show you that it is being protected. It's a good thing. I just, I, I just want to say that this, is not, this whole process is new to me. I, I wasn't aware that you got your own water samples and then sent them off to an independent company to test that water, so there's no, there's no regulation or oversight as far as getting those samples, correct? Uh, no, there's there's no. Let me, let me try to, and, and Russ, just so everyone's aware, there are over 8,000 power plants currently in the U.S. There are over 2,500 utilities. Every single one of those power plants and utilities does self-testing and self-reporting per FERC and NERC. So it is a well-established, very well-accepted policy or procedure that we do, that, that entities do. It's not uncommon. It's not foreign. No. It's what they do. And they report those things under, under penalty of, of law. So it's extremely common. It's been happening for decades in this country. Is there a change in language? It seems to be an important point. So I, I'll just go into a little bit about the groundwater sampling process and, and we have Indiana Department of Environmental Management can, can talk about it afterwards. The sampling protocols for groundwater are very rigid in terms of the process that you have to follow in to, to be able to take an accurate groundwater sample. The records that you have to keep when you do the sampling is all part of the information that gets submitted to the state they'll review that information. So the process itself to take a groundwater sample is a very established protocol that has to be followed. So, so the person taking the sampling, taking the sample from this semi-annual to the next semi-annual, always has to follow that same process. There's amount of time and a series of parameters that you have to monitor for that, that have to stabilize to ensure that you're taking actual groundwater from the ground. All of those records are included in these semi-annual reports. Once that sample is taken, there's a chain of custody process that's, that's followed in which that person takes it to an independent laboratory and there's a signatory process involved in terms of handoff so that everybody in the chain of custody has to sign off on that groundwater sample. So the process itself is very rigid <coughs> in terms of what's necessary to take a groundwater sample. Because that process is so rigid, 
that allows, I mean, all owners take their own, for the most part, take their own groundwater sample. All of that documentation is provided to the state. Some owners even run their own analyses. We do not. We use an independent laboratory. There really is the issue of whether or not, but that's, that's the process that's followed to take a groundwater sample. And, and Russ, not to interrupt, but if it's okay with you, if we could uh, handle the public comments and questions at the conclusion of the program. We only have room until 8.30, and I want to honor all the groups that are here so they can all weigh in. Um, we'll make sure everyone's questions are asked and answered, certainly. Uh, well, I have a question pertaining to what he was just talking about prior to the last comment. If I could interject, it would be very quick and brief. I, um, I'm fine. sorry. You, no, you were sorry. talking about uh, – You were. my name is Brian DeBiller. You were talking about uh, dust suppression – uh, with regard to, I believe, the, some of the closure yes. obligations. Um, back on April 12th, uh, we had an incident where basically the whole city was consumed in a dust cloud of fugitive, I assume, fly ash yes. from the pond behind Pizza Hut. Now, I called IDEM, and I spoke to Amanda Dant. Is that correct? Or Vant? I'm not sure. She's in air quality. I should have her name correct. Um, I spoke to her about that and uh, another gentleman uh, there, she had advised me to call the emergency response uh, number after I initially called, but uh, I think that's something we were all aware of. Uh, do you have any explanation as to what occurred that day or why we experienced that? Because that wasn't the first time, that was probably the most severe incident that we had of fugitive dust in the city, and I'm assuming that that's probably not good for people to breathe. Um, I didn't analyze the, you know, the dust or anything, but considering its source, um, I think that the uh, city was kind of concerned about that, so I didn't know. Yes, we had an incident on April 12th. Any explanation expl as to what caused it? I yeah, mean, the what? The explanation that what caused it was that we had a water truck that broke down. Okay. And by the time we, and, and that incident happened, and it was just, it, you know, it just, that's the explanation that we had is our dust our dust measures that we had in for our water truck our water truck sure. broke down and there was a time period before we got it fixed I, I know you weren't personally responsible for it well, I'm, not, I'm not no point, I'm, I'm not I'm, pointing I'm, my finger at you but I, I spoke to the mayor about that and he and I conversed and I think you even shot some video video footage footage of it uh, on a prior occurrence there, but there that was, was just something that concerned me uh, you know with it being airborne I don't know if you saw any of those pictures, there, but it, was, it, it was the equivalent of, it looked like a picture from the Dust Bowl. I mean, you couldn't even see the Sigrams buildings. Understood. Uh, there was so much dust, so yeah. just wanted no, to throw that in there because you were I've, talking about I, I do dust, understand, so. and, and since that time, we've, we've, there is a dust suppression plan that's been developed, and we are implementing it, and understand. Okay, thank you. Security is one other obligation that we have, and then again, the post-closure care is required for 30 years unless modified by the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. I think that that's, that's an obligation that everybody needs to understand. Once this is closed, we do not walk away. There's an obligation to, to continue to monitor groundwater, continue to monitor and maintain that cap for 30 years. Just wanted to briefly touch on this is, is the regulatory approval and the public involvement. This meeting tonight really is, is a public information meeting. This is, we, we are doing this with guidance from Indiana Department of Environmental Management because of the interest in this closure plan. This does not, this, the design documents themselves we will make available uh, either in the library or uh, on, on, uh, they will be, become available on the Indiana Department of Environmental Management website. And what this really does is this is a preliminary, this is more of a public information meeting and in that there will be a formal public comment process that will follow this. That public comment process will have a duration of 30 days. So we are not short-circuiting this, this is just if you will, it, it's a voluntary public information meeting for you to try to answer some of the questions. And this is occurring prior to the public comment process. Okay. 
And I think Dell would like to jump in here and then just defer this, I think, to later. Uh, yes, please. So thank you, Russ. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And um, we appreciate the uh, public questions and comments, obviously. These are uh, exactly the reasons why we've kind of gathered uh, these people in the room today. Now, you, you've heard from uh, ELT, CDC, Tanner's Creek, and they've kind of explained to you what's going on uh, with the closure plan. However, tonight is about everything, not just the closure plan. And so with that in mind, I next one to introduce uh, and again thank the members of IDEM who have uh, driven here um, a, a much larger and robust group than even we could have hoped for uh, when we started calling around frantically just seeing uh, who the best people we could get here uh, would be. Uh, Rebecca Yanoshkin is kind of leading this group so Becky thank you for being here if you could just kind of introduce yourself and your group and I think what we're most interested in hearing about tonight and I won't speak for everyone is um, if you could touch on some of the issues that were brought up uh, during the ELT presentation. But more generally than that, uh, we need to know, is our water safe? How is it uh, made safe? And how is that process continuing so that we can rest assured that activity like this plant cleanup uh, does not jeopardize our water supply? So thank you for being here. I can't hear myself. Oh, th there we go. Um, thank you all. First, th thank you all for coming tonight and for your interest um, in this project. We appreciate you taking your evening out to learn, um, and and we definitely welcome your participation and comments and input in this process. Um, we've been working with with uh, Tanner's Creek since they took over ownership of this property, and uh, uh, through a, a number of different things. Um, so. What Russ has just finished talking about is a closure plan um, relating to the fly ash pond. So I think I'll start there. That pond, um, we've received um, closure plans. We've had a, a number of back and forths there, um, but we're getting fairly close to um, being able to approve that, and and to get them to f to uh, they'll then you know follow the closure plan. Um, and that I guess let me explain that the closure plan kind of steps through what they're going to do to really to, to cap that and, and be done with that. Once those activities are complete, um, the, the fugitive dust problem um, should completely go away. Um, right now we've got you know, kind of waste exposed there and there. We, were, we went out to the facility today to look around and they do have the water truck out there and, and operating you know, constantly um, to, to keep that under control. So um, we did receive, you know, your reports and, um, you know, we'll definitely try to keep moving on the approval of the closure plan because <coughs> that, uh, completing those activities will um, el eliminate that issue. Um, let's see. So the fly ash pond, as, as they were saying, has a liner underneath it, which for the time period in which it was constructed is somewhat unusual. and and a positive, very positive thing. Um, through the closure plan review process, you know, we've been looking at the proximity of the drinking water supply wells. And I know that's of, of and it's reasonable, very reasonable and to ask questions and be concerned about that. And we're concerned about that as well. Um, and so part of the closure plan review and approval process will include the addition of monitoring wells and making sure we really have a good understanding of um, if there are releases currently, what those are, and how to um, to set up a system that anticipates and gives us that that early warning system, so that w that is contained within uh, the closure plan, and we're working um, on on getting that well network set up. Um, what else are we going to talk about? I have a question. And, and Becky, if I may, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to just. Uh, ask you really random questions. I think specifically uh, I can help guide this a little bit. Um, so when we talk about monitoring wells, what's a monitoring well and why is that important? So yeah, I guess to distinguish that we have two different kinds of wells that we're just we're talking about. Monitoring wells are specifically installed around land disposal 
um, units like this. So we have the fly ash pond, we have a restricted waste site landfill, and we've got the main ash pond. Um, all three of those disposal units will have monitoring wells um, surrounding them. So they're, um, they're fairly narrow wells. Th they're not production wells to produce drinking water. Um, they're wells that we use to, to take samples a couple of times a year. We have a groundwater monitoring plan that's included in um, either the closure plan or the permit, um, depending on which unit we're, we're talking about. That plan identifies the locations of the wells, their construction, their depth, you know, what the parameters that we're analyzing for. Um, there's also a plan, you guys talked about that a bit, about how you collect those samples, that chain of custody, the laboratory, kind of the content and format of the report. And, and those groundwater monitoring um, results are submitted to the agency. Um, and John Garitas here and his staff um, review those reports. One of th the way that program works is we kind of start with some baseline information. We w get some background information and develop a, a statistical plan that helps us know, okay, what does the water look like? And then if there were a release, kind of how, how would we know? How much above that background level would you say, okay, we've got a problem, we've got a release, we need to, to do further investigation and potentially um, implement some corrective actions to, to limit that release and, and remediate that release. So, uh, so that's monitoring well yes, networks. And then the other thing you're talking about is that they're drinking water supply wells. So those are what we call production wells. Those are you know, pulling large volumes of water. So when we go out and take a groundwater monitoring sample, we're talking a pint? Uh, we're not, uh, there, how much volume of water would you pull out of one of those? A couple gallons. So much different than a groundwater, you know, drinking water supply well, um, a production well. So two very different types of wells and definitely important that you just, yeah, that you understand that concept. So in terms of this property in particular and specifically the time period after which ELT uh, began their remediation process. Could you walk us through generally um, your goals, your focus, and, and what you've done um, to ensure that th uh, this cleanup is done in a safe way? So with regards to the fly ash pond, there's we really, there's no kind of remedial activity going on there. Um, we are closing that disposal unit. Um, the, the cap and cover kind of serve, we were, uh, somebody talked about this before. I imagine we've got a, a pond there and it's really been serving as a bathtub and that's good, that's what it was designed to do. Um, you know, they've been sluicing ash there for many, many years um, and it's been holding that ash in place and then slowly that ash is dewatered and, dewatered and the water is collected and sent over to the, the plant where it was treated. But now we don't need that, we don't need that bathtub anymore. And so they're putting a cap and cover over the top of it to reduce and essentially eliminate any infiltration from the top so that ash will be, you know, dewatered and we should, you know, basically be getting to dry ash within that landfill that should not be producing um, water, you know, that could be released. Um, and then we, we have that unit ringed with groundwater monitoring wells so that we can watch that. Um, there's a liner there, it, but it was in put in place in the 70s, and you know, there's, we just, that's kind of what we do when we, and this isn't unique to this location. Wherever we have um, any sort of landfill, um, we are, you know, ringing it with groundwater monitoring wells, and we're watching that, we're monitoring that for any release, um, so that if we need to, we can go in and, and remediate that. And beyond the closure plan, um, in terms of the demolition project and any materials that might be generated from that project. Um, uh, gentleman talked about uh, the foundations or just the mm -hmm. materials that are part of the stacks. Um, how do we ensure that those materials aren't going to stay on the property and contaminate the soil that would then contaminate the water? So the, the, the units, the disposal units that we are focused on as a group right now are the fly ash pond, the restricted waste site landfill, and the main ash pond. So that's what we have formal closure plans and permits around. But let me answer your question. So uh, clean demolition debris, rocks, dust, you know, dirt, even clean vegetation is not, 
considered to be solid waste in the state of Indiana. So as long as those materials are clean, they can be disposed of most anywhere. Um, so I am not all, I'm not familiar with the demolition plan. Um, we've been focused on the units that we're responsible for closing. So I'm not sure exactly where all of um, all the materials that are being generated from that demolition are going, but if, if they are waste, if they're classified as solid waste, they need to go to a solid waste landfill. If they're hazardous waste, they need to go to a hazardous waste facility. But if they're excluded materials, like uncontaminated rocks, bricks, dirt, they can be managed on site. And who, whose responsibility is it to monitor the demolition materials? That, that is, not, is not items. Um, and uh, you may have some more information on what you're doing on that. I, we just don't have a lot of involvement in that area. So. No, the, the, the demolition process by its nature generates clean debris, bricks, and concrete, which is best in, in you, know, you know, the state of the industry is to try to beneficially reuse that as much as possible rather than take it to a landfill. So it's our obligation to with its clean concrete and, the, and bricks, as indicated, that's not a regulated material. That material it can be used as backfill for basements and deep within the, the structures, which is commonly done. Most of the time that material will be downsized and, it, and it's placed in the structures. It, it is similar to you would of any other type of backfill material. It's no different of a backfill material than if we would import clean soil. Okay. And I, I will concur that that is common practice. That's not unusual, um, that you use the materials you have on site. We, hold on just a second. We'd, you will see, uh, you see this more and more as you see different facilities coming down. Uh, people dismantle facilities now very intentionally um, and, and go to, quite a bit of effort to segregate, you know, what's metal, what's reusable brick, what's, uh, and, and to really not take anything for final disposal and have to pay for that disposal, you know, then they have to. Um, so uh, that's part of kind of our shift in terms of waste management from just viewing everything as waste and, and focusing a little bit more on what's the, um, the resource value of some of these materials. And so I'm sure that that's, I mean, that's part of kind of demolishing these sorts of structures, but not having it just all be a disposal cost. You know, you try to make the best use of the materials that you generate. Yes, sir. What is, what, real oh, quick, sorry. I can just follow that up. What is regulated during the demolition process, mm -hmm. though, is asbestos materials, universal waste. Universal wastes are light bulbs, mm -hmm. mercury switches, any of any, a, a variety of different types of what you would consider to be you know, you can get a lot of light bulbs, you can get a lot of just mercury switches, you can get obviously any kind of oils or sludges and any kind of electrical equipment, or that any type of, so all of that is regulated on the upfront of a demolition process. All of that is removed <coughs> as, as part of it prior to any type of demolition activity and there is an obligation that, that we, that is gone through in which there are items, ins inspections, routine inspections, to ensure that all those types of materials are removed prior to demolition. And so, Mr. Becker, you can assure us that we don't have to worry that there are harmful materials like asbestos that are on the property that will remain on the property, because I think that's a concern we have, that those, pr those materials may not contaminate the soil or the water now, but that they could at some point if they're left there. Removal of asbestos is a, is, is a, is a regulated practice in which mm -hmm. you have to use a licensed contractor to do it, with a license within the state of Indiana. There's a process where they go through notifications and through inspections, and, then the, and, and once they're complete, depending on the type of facility, you'll have a final inspection either by state of Indiana or by that licensed contractor that all asbestos has been removed. We, need to, we need to have that process complete before any demolition can occur. And that was my next question. Thank you. When would that inspection occur? Those inspections when asbestos was being, was being removed, I think were happening probably on a frequency of once per month. Okay. Um, thank you. And, and thank you, Becky. 
again, just generally understanding uh, the kind of the questions and concerns, um, what would you say that uh, IDEM's focus will be moving forward as we, uh, because this is closure plan for one pond, correct? There are mm -hmm. so many steps that remain uh, in regard to this property. So what's item's focus moving forward? So our, we'll prioritize um, getting the fly ash pond closure plan approved so they can start um, implementing that. And um, while we're kind of right as, as close in the construction season here, try to get that accomplished. Um, the next thing we have in-house already is the um, restricted waste site <coughs> landfill <coughs> permit renewal application is in-house. So um, we'll be reviewing that. Um, I haven't looked at that, but I understand from our conversation that uh, that will pretty much, uh, I don't think that's there's going to be a lot um, involved with that review, um, just kind of keeping it stable and, and um, continuing care there. Um, the third thing that's happening, I, okay, um, is we expect, I think in early August is what we've heard most recently, closure plan to address the main ash pond. So this is the ash pond that's kind of right at the confluence of the Ohio and Tanner's Creek. Um, and, and it's the, uh, the main ash pond, the, coal, the old ash pond? You had two there's other? There's, yeah, there's an old ash area. And it basically is going to be a closure plan for the remaining areas next to the plant of mm -hmm. which there are ash materials present and exposed at the surface. So that all that entire area in order to support redevelopment needs to go through a closure process. That closure process and that plan is being developed now that will go through. We'll go through the same exact process but with item mm -hmm. and, and with public involvement for, for that part of the plan. So we haven't seen that yet, but that you know that'll be kind of the, the third piece um, for us. And I do want to uh, circle back briefly to uh, some of the discussion because I think even you mentioned the age of the liner um, and then there was some discussion about the size uh, or the location of the banks and I'll probably botch the terminology but the, in terms of the liner itself and we've talked about the importance of the integrity of these you know layers of soil and then the non-permeable cap mm -hmm. how does item ensure that that is structurally sound and that is uh, put together in a way that will protect the surrounding environment. So I was talking earlier about the bathtub. So, you know, we have that liner is in there and that's the bottom of the bathtub at this point. They're dewatering those materials and, you know, they're getting closer and closer to those being dry. Certainly once the cap and cover are over the top, um, we're dealing with dry material. And so, and, and I know there was a question earlier about kind of groundwater or water table rising up and would that disrupt that liner? And I don't think the groundwater table is anywhere close to the bottom of that liner, so right. don't expect any uplift or issue there. So the, the it, it is an older liner. Certainly in this, in, in most situations, we would, n we would not have this volume of waste exhumed so we could put down a new liner. So. We're just we're going to work with what we have there, but once we have that ash dried out inside, you know we have the cap and the cover over the top and the liners underneath. <coughs> there really isn't, um, you know, we don't have groundwater percolating in from the side. What they were describing earlier was, you know, that cap and cover would tie would would go beyond the liner and kind of tie into that. So really making nice little pouch pocket there um, that. There really should not be water releases, releases of water from that unit. So, and I would like to add to that real quick. Absolutely. Well, and just briefly, so my follow-up to that would be, regardless of the age of the liner mm -hmm. or the type of the pond, because all of these ponds are very different and the closure plan will look different, but the mm -hmm. end result is that highest level of scrutiny. We won't cut corners uh, yeah. in terms of the end result and the protection of the water. Is that fair to say. Right. Our, I mean, we're charged as an agency to protect human health and the environment, and yeah, we, we take that very seriously. We have, you know, staff that have worked, you know, spent their entire professional careers focused on these sorts of issues, and, you know, we are um, overseeing the closure plan here um, in the same way we would do it across the state to the same, you know, what we think are high standards and, and according to the rules and regulations that we have. So. No, thank you. Yeah, I apologize. That's, that's fine. Uh, to add to the um, concerns over the degradation of the cap and of the liner, uh, these 
these liner materials are types of plastic that are very similar uh, to actually the trash bags that you use at home, but they're much thicker. Mm -hmm. Same material, but much thicker. And once this material is uh, basically taken out of oxidation and UV radiation, meaning it's not exposed to the surface, sunlight, and weathering, uh, it will last thousands of years. Um, during construction, you usually have concerns about puncture, uh, but they put in a soft layer when they install the bottom liner to, to account for that. And then when you're doing final construction, you're very careful with the layer right underneath the liner. And then on top of that, you have your, your geo grid, which again protects it, so puncture isn't concerned. So this material will last for thousands of years in the condition in which it's installed. Um, and then to go beyond that um, with regards to your concerns about groundwater monitoring and dust suppression and everything else, when these capping systems are put in place, it is important to know for everybody in the area that there will be more monitoring wells and more testing and more eyes on construction than there has ever been during the filling of these areas. Okay, so these areas will be more monitored more closely and they'll be more scrutinized through clo throughout closure, once these plans are constructed, than there is beforehand. While the whole the entire time AEP had this property, we go in there and we clean it up and we try to take things that are exposed and either remove them or cap them, consolidate and protect the environment and the people. And in order to do that, we need to move forward with these plans. And you said, uh, sir, that you, upon completion, you will have an ongoing 30-year obligation to guarantee the quality of, of these closure plans. Is that accurate? Uh, that's accurate. That can be adjusted by the state as needed, uh, as, as it would be on another landfill of something nature. Sometimes it's extended, uh, depending upon if there is concerns, as, as Becky alluded to, if there is a well that detects something maybe, then that then you go in immediately, and sometimes your, your closure plan can start all over depending upon what is detected. In most cases, nothing's ever detected and things close normally and everything's fine, but if something should happen, that 30-year period doesn't get us off the hook. It means we still have to go in there and maybe do more than that. And to that end, uh, does AEP have an ongoing obligation? That is what we're here to address. That That's is what right. our company does. We, we, we address the concerns and obligations, environmental obligations of companies like AEP and many other very large companies that have manufacturing facilities, power plants, former landfills, oil refineries, oil refineries, Many other types of uh, environmental contaminated sites, we clean them up. And that, th Sorry, that was. Can we, can we go off your script and let people ask their own questions? Yes. Yeah, we'll have public comments and questions at the conclusion. And, we, and we've got. We got 15 minutes, and you're going to talk during all of it. We have extra time. It'll be okay. We'll get out to everyone's questions. So, to that end, um, that was something that was uh, interesting for me to learn is that. It isn't just ELT, CDC, AEP has an ongoing obligation that they are fulfilling through you, but they also have persons that are monitoring the site and monitoring. And the AEP monitors separately. the work, continues to monitor the work we are doing. Yes. Okay, thank you. And, and just, uh, first of all, again, your questions will be asked. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask them yourselves, but the questions that I'm asking are based on uh, what I've been hearing from the public, so I just want to make sure everyone's voice is heard today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thank you. Uh, ELT, thank you to IDEM. I do want to uh, allow our utility director, Olin Clausen, uh, to speak briefly, if he'll humor me, um, because uh, after hearing what ELT has presented, after t hearing what IDEM has presented, I think Olin can weigh in on his perspective uh, as our local spearhead for monitoring this uh, property independently and just what his findings are and how they align with what we've heard today. So. Well, and I appreciate it. Dale, maybe real quick, I think. Yeah, we'll get to you, Brian. Well, we'll get to you. Okay, thank you. I appreciate everybody being patient. <coughs> so I think what's important to understand from the utilities perspective is that we, myself and my staff, no, no one's more concerned about the quality of the water uh, that we're sending to our residents than we are. Um, there's testing that's required by the state. It's kind of on a rotation, but it basically boils down to a three-year testing period. We have on a regular basis taken it upon ourselves to test the wells, not just Lawrenceburg's wells, but also LMS and Aurora's wells, uh, on a more regular basis to ascertain for ourselves what the quality of the water actually is. Uh, we've also compared some of that data to the data that is, that's on hand, some of that you referenced to look for um, 
indications that there might be an uptick in things that are harmful to to our residents. Uh, based on those those test results, we haven't seen any indication that there is any evidence of an upward trending problem in any of the drinking wells. Uh, boron gets brought up quite a bit and uh, there's been one well that's tested um, higher than the others. Uh, the World Health Organization, I believe, lists boron as a problem at, at 10,000, roughly 10,000 parts per million, per billion, I'm sorry, per billion. And that well is currently testing at 1,000 parts per billion. So it's 9,000 times underneath the the level p upon which the World Ho Health Organization considers that to be a problem. And, and also, you know, it's, w we, we as a utility, just like any utility, we, we have a set of ground rules that we have to play by. Uh, there are things that we have to report on. There's things that we have to uh, make sure that we, that we're watching, that we're uh, dealing with. And it's not up to us as a local entity to go out and get ahead of the state or the federal government on dictating whether or not boron should be a regulated uh, item. Uh, if it were, and if there was a requirement that it was to be under a certain limit, then obviously we would, uh, we would do what we had to do to, to ensure that that were the case. Um, but as it stands today, it's not identified by the state of Indiana. And so therefore, we, we, we haven't been compelled to, to look into that. Doesn't mean that we're not concerned about it. Doesn't mean that we're not looking at it. It's just something that we don't have, we don't have any opinion on really. Um, we're well aware of what the levels are according to other organizations and we're well, well below those. And so as a utility director, when I have, when I have elderly customers calling me, um, telling me that they're afraid to take baths uh, because of the things they're reading on Facebook, and that them and the other people in their apartment complex are going out and buying bottled water because of the things they're reading on Facebook. Uh, that's concerning to me. That's, that, is, that is a form of fear-mongering that, that I don't appreciate and that I don't think is helpful to this process whatsoever. And so myself and my staff have gone to great lengths to try to, to calm some of those fears to provide factual data uh, to our customers, to the residents of Dearborn County, the city, Aurora, LMS. And it, it's, it's sometimes frustrating when, when our efforts to provide that factual data are, are subverted or they're deleted from, from certain uh, public posts. And so I, I guess in closing, from the utilities perspective, Again, nobody's more concerned than we are. Um, we have been very proactive on, on our testing and providing that information to our elected officials uh, so they can provide that to their constituents, and we, we will continue to do that. And, and nobody is going to scream louder or longer than, than Lawrenceburg Municipal Utilities if, in fact, we find a problem that warrants that. I have a few questions. Sorry. Um, I've been waiting. Okay. And I'll just be quick. I was just going to kind of uh, resonate uh, uh, the comments uh, from your local utility. Um, yeah, we we also take you know drinking water quality you know very seriously, and um, one of our our prime um, jobs is to oversee that information that's sent in from, you know, our local utilities. And uh, we're, we kind of follow the Safe Drinking Water Act, which you all do too. And it has a, a, a myriad of different parameters that, you know, are regulated by federal government. And I don't know if that's me or, okay. Oh, I'm getting feedback. So, um, so anyway, uh, 
your utilities are doing a great job. Um, it, that can be reflected in, and reviewed through their consumer confidence reports that they submit to us every year. Um, it's available. I don't know how each of you receive them, but you know they can be either online or come through your billing. Uh, but it's you know basically an overview of you know the results of what they've found in their water through the year and the uh, activities that they do to you know promote safe drinking water. And I was very encouraged to hear that they are sampling their, is it the raw water that you're all sampling? Yeah, uh, which is you know a, a real good indication of what they are seeing at the source. Um, not only are they meeting the requirements of the distribution, which is the treated water, uh, but they're also going above and beyond looking at that water that is at their well, um, which is not required. So um, oh, kudos. Um, and if you'd like to share that information with us, that would be one more thing, you know, that we could use, you know, in, in kind of you know, watching what things are going on here. So I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Olin. Um, and I do want to turn this over to questions and comments. Again, this uh, town hall, this forum is, is for you guys. Um, so I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. We have asked for additional time from Ivy Tech. So I'm going to bring the microphone around. Just say your name for the record. Uh, maybe where you're from, and then state your question, um, and then we'll let uh, whoever is the most appropriate uh, answer it. Absolutely. I have a couple more questions. Um, could you guys, uh, with all due respect, um, you're all from IDEM. Could you all introduce yourself yeah. and please tell me what you do for IDEM? Yeah, sorry. Please. Kind of were asked to do that earlier and just kind of moved right through it. My name is um, Becky Yonishkan, and I'm the branch chief for the permits branch within the Office of Land Quality. And so in that branch, we have um, staff that um, manage solid waste permits, which is, that's John Hale here to my left, and Amy McClure is over there. She's John's section chief. Kay. So that's the person that, um, like you'll see on the fact sheet that we've handed out, um, You'll, on the bottom, on the back, we talk sure. about a, a comment period. So John Hale is the person who's managing this, um, the closure plan process yeah. for us and the permit and, and the other. I've spoke to John on the phone okay. a few times. So. Right, so that's John. Um, nice and to then meet you, within the branch, we have a group of engineers and a group of geologists mm -hmm. that um, provide you know technical review of these applications. So they're also an integral. We don't have, well, and, and so John Garitas is here this evening. Um, and I'm going to let Jim nice introduce himself. You. So John, John Garitas is our section chief for um, geology. So his geologists have been busy looking at the situation here. What sure. Go ahead, introduce yourself again. Oh, well, I didn't know if you were done. <laughs> um, again, my name is John Garitas, and I am the section chief of the geology section in the Office of Land Quality. Um, I have a team of geologists. There's about, I think there's 11, 11 of us that go over reports that Russ was talking about, and we look at them very diligently. We review all the data, we review the statistics, uh, we review the laboratory reports, and so when they're submitted to us, we basically give our okay, or we say, sorry, but this, but this report, the testing was done incorrectly, so you would have to go out and retest again. So, there was concern earlier about a company doing their own testing. These reports are submitted to us, and we look at them, um, and we look at municipal solid waste landfill reports, we look at non-municipal, we look at restricted waste sites, such as restricted waste site one out here um, at Tanner's Creek. We look at, uh, um, we even look at compost areas. So anyway, the. The point is that these reports are looked at by geologists um, very diligently, and if there are problems, we do get with the facility and we tell them the problems, and if the testing needs to be redone, the testing will be redone. So it's just not put into a black box. And if you go on to VFC and look at uh, some of the geology, um, we usually send the facility a letter, or we may send an email stating what we find in their reports. So I just want to make that clear that, that it isn't put into a black box at IDEM and in the reports, and that's where they sit. They are reviewed in a very diligent manner with um, a team of about 11, 12 geologists. 
Sure. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in that filing cabinet digging around looking at stuff. Um, I have just a general statement that I want to make with regard to this meeting. I think the majority of the residents here uh, came to address some of the concerns uh, with the site in general. Um, it really didn't pertain to the Fly Ash Pond closure. Um, we just became aware, and I speak for myself and a few of my friends, I don't know about anybody else in the room, uh, but we just became aware of that this meeting was to address the Fly Ash Pond closure uh, public comment hearing. That was kind of news to us. We've only known about that for about five days. I know typically with that, there's a 10-day public notice uh, period with that. We've seen a lot of information on social media, people asking questions about that. Um, could you guys address that or kind of explain that to us, please? So in our rules and regulations, we do not have a specific public participation process for closure plans. So um, a few years ago, as we um, started um, working through, th there's a new federal regulation um, concerning coal combustion residuals. This particular facility is not subject to that federal regulation. The 2015 EPA updates. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Right. That um, those those do require that the all the pond areas be lined. Is that correct? No. Well, no? Uh, um, if yes, the if you were building a new, do. if you right. were building a new surface impoundment today, yes, you would need a liner. Okay. Um, but okay, so there's a federal regulation that's gone into effect for coal combustion residuals. Correct. These surface impoundments and um, restricted waste site landfill are not subject to those right. federal regulations. Okay, so, but we we have a large, um, we have a lot of power plants in Indiana, we have a lot of coal, and we have about 84 surface impoundments across the state at maybe 14, 15 different power plants. Right. Um, and some of those are subject to the federal regulation, and some of them are subject to closure under our state rules. And so we worked with um, Hoosier Environmental Council and the Sierra Club and a number of groups like that who wanted to make sure that there was a public participation opportunity um, sure. for these closure plans. So um, even though it's not required by our statute or our rules, and again, this particular um, Tanner's Creek is not subject to the federal regulation, um, we developed a process um, to have meetings like this and provide opportunity for the um, public to understand what's going on and to make sure that they could comment on the plans. So, so to cut it short, you're, you're I, saying I developed there's, there's a guidance. not a 10 day notification. I developed a guidance um, document and that's on our website and that's we worked on that internally and it's kind of, three we two keep nine trying 12 to. 10 one? No. Um, maybe I don't have it's that right. Yeah, well, 329 IEC, oh. t no, anyway, it's, we are following a guidance document sure. and a, a process that we developed kind of in cooperation with the environmental advocacy, advocacy groups and the regulated utilities um, to give you opportunities. So it's not a perfect process. Sure. Um, it's in general led by the applicant themselves rather than um, required by us. W there are some recommended activities. We don't absolutely have to have a meeting. So it's, it's fairly flexible to try to be able to react to the community needs um, okay. I regret that maybe there was short notice. I um, just feel like there. people weren't given ample time to have to um, myself. I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I was so focused on some of the other things we were talking about in the community and some of the, the uh, issues that I really didn't have time myself personally to research the uh, fly ash pond closure plan. So okay. it was kind of last minute. For and me, but um, I mean, uh, the comment period is that we've now opened is open through July 10th. I understand um, that, and I appreciate your feedback there. And I'll go back and look at the guidance document again and see if there's something that we need to change to make sure that we have maybe a little bit more advance warning um, before these sorts of meetings. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just saying it because I know people yeah. came here with questions that really pertain more to other things, more so than the flash pond closure. But uh, real and quick, I don't want to take up any more time because I know there's other people that have questions. Uh, we talked about the, uh, I'm going to refer to it as the Dust Bowl incident on April the 12th. Mm -hmm. I know I called in and reported that, and uh, the gentleman here pretty, you know, clearly acknowledged that it was a problem that occurred. Was there a violation issued for that? Because I'm not seeing it the in the yeah, VFC, the and I was curious why there wasn't 
So a fugitive dust, release of fugitive dust is uh, within our Office of Air Quality. Right. I did I it was Amanda Dant that I spoke okay. to. I just referred to my email. And I am, I am, I do not know whether or not a formal violation was pursued there. Do you know, Dell? I do, actually. And uh, Brian uh, and, a, and some other concerned citizens did a wonderful job in rallying that morning. Uh, it wasn't the first time we've had a fugitive dust problem. Right. Um, and to that end, uh, the mayor and I, we're actually doing an ins inspection on the river watch here. Um, and we heard that there were some uh, complaints from uh, Brian, a, a local business owner, um, mayor, and our safety director, Mike Abden, went on site uh, and uh, demanded to speak with uh, the, the local supervisor on site, demanded to speak with the uh, uh, owner of the property, the supervisor of the property uh, on the telephone. In addition to that, um, we were able to, we were directed to our Brownstown office, Mark Amick. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, the director there, by 3 p.m., they had uh, sent a team down to make an inspection. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, or however you look at it, by that time, um, the, their requirement is that there has to be fugitive dust measurable at least six feet high seen, uh, visually confirmed to be exiting the property. And, and there is a report on virtual file cabinet. It is kind of hard to find. You're actually in it, Brian, and yeah. we are too. Um, they issued a warning, however, it was a warning with required um, follow-ups, and so it, you know, it did serve the uh, purpose of having a remediation plan, which to my knowledge includes ensuring that all three water trucks are in operation, right. ensuring that the mats are placed, and hopefully ensuring that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, we really hadn't had an issue with that historically before, um, so that was, that was one of my concerns, but... Uh, I had some other questions, but we're running short on time. And I know there's a lot of other people in here that want to speak. So uh, I thank you very much for your time You're and welcome. appreciate your answers. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Jerry Bashirs. Uh, how many uh, fly ash ponds are on the property? There, there's one particular pond that is given the name Fly Ash Pond, mm -hmm. okay, and that was the one that was shown in orange on the drawing. Um, that pond is the one that we're capping. Now, there are other ponds that contain... And how many? There, there is another pond that is about the same size as called the Main Ash Pond. Now, that one, again, we're working on plans to cap that one in the, next, in the upcoming year. That one will be addressed. Then there is what we call the Old Ash Pond, which is adjoining it. that will be capped at the same time. There is a type one restricted waste landfill, which contains ash and other CCR wastes. That's not technically a pond, but it's an ash impoundment of sorts. That is currently covered with intermediate cover or soil. Um, it's under permit, that will need to be closed out as well. And there's another area that contains, what is often referred to as bottom ash or boiler slag, which was actually, uh, when they were producing it, it was uh, put into large bags and was sent off site for sale as blasting media. So there are several areas that contain ash, but as far as the fly ash pond, that exact name is only given to one pond. I see. And the, uh, the other ponds on the property, uh, do they, uh, you spoke that they're going to be capped. Uh, are they, uh, is there a concrete liner underneath those? Uh, concrete is never used as a liner for uh, ash impoundments. Uh, for one, uh, it I'm is sorry. What, then what what is the liner on the the main pond that you've been talking the about? The main ash pond was constructed with clay. With clay. Yes. Which so it, which at the time was very common practice. It was very common practice up until the last few decades. I see. Are uh, any of these other uh, ponds on the property lined with anything? Well, the the clay was brought in and compacted as a liner. That that was placed as a liner. It's on, not a synthetic on, on liner, but it's a liner nonetheless. On all the uh, ponds? Now, on the other, on the other ponds... Uh, pardon me, pardon me. On all the ponds? That on, all, on all the containment areas? On the ponds, the clay was... At least clay was placed, yes. Now, uh -huh. the newer ones had the synthetic liner as well. I see. Thank you. See, I like you guys. You asked direct questions. You want a direct answer? You'd be a good lawyer. Uh, so you were looking for three. There are three... It's my understanding there are three wet ponds and one dry landfill, most generally speaking, and obviously it's more The, the old ash area that. is a smaller pond that is sometimes lumped into the main ash pond because it's adjacent to it and will be capped with it, but it's technically a separate pond. It's a smaller pond. That would be the third one. And there's no, uh, there's no chance of 
Well, theoretically, there is always a, a chance per se, but that is why we do groundwater monitoring so that there is, if there is a release, it's caught. Now, most of the time, a release is not caught because it doesn't occur, but theoretically, nothing's perfect and there's always a potential for, a very small potential, but a potential for a, a leak. And that is why we also put in systems of groundwater monitoring wells, which were spoken about by IDEM. And that monitoring process continues on long after the actual cap is, is put into place. And that is why when these caps are put into place, there will actually be more protection in place than there ever has been while these ash ponds had ash put into them. Yeah, so you said that there's a, there's a clay liner underneath it, but the, the engineering documents actually show that's a, that's a silty clay with sand and not, not pure clay. So I don't think the word liner is really appropriate to use there. And the TRC soil studies from 2014 actually show that over in the, uh, the old ash area, uh, that used to be part of Tanner's Creek, so there is no soil beneath that whatsoever, and that it is basically ash all the way down. And I have those documents here if you haven't reflected on those. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that was not an entirely accurate statement. Um, I, I, wanted, I wanted to revisit the, uh, the water quality issue about the, the monitoring wells because it was pointed out that the, uh, the monitoring wells are there to, to monitor for the release of, the, just basically to monitor from release from the landfill uh, and not actual contaminants. And I wondered why uh, there was a distinction being made between whether they were coming from the landfill or whether the contaminants were there at all. And I think that's a very important, uh, an important issue because it's a, it's a distinction without a difference. You might need to rephrase the question, but I think what, you're, what the process is in any land disposal unit, there's an obligation to monitor groundwater that could be impacted from it. And that's what the intended process is to do. I'm not sure what, how to, how to further answer your question. I'll, I'll ask it a better way. And sorry, uh, Dell just asked me to introduce myself. I'm Matt Miles. Um, and so the, let me see if I can ask this a better way. Basically, if, if there are contaminants shown in the monitoring wells that would essentially prevent the drinking water from being drinkable, why is that distinguished from whether they came from the landfill or whether they're there on all the monitoring wells. So if we see them both up gradient and down gradient, that's technically not a violation when the fact is they're there regardless of how they got there. So I think, as I said before, that was a distinction without a difference. The contaminants are there regardless of whether they came from the landfill or not. The fact is they do exist. They are not a, they are not a myth or an imagination. They're documented in public records and they're half a mile from the, uh, they're half a mile from the, the wellhead and the, the water flow documents prove that the water is flowing from that direction toward the, the, toward the wellhead. And I have all that here if you want to review that. And, and could we have ELT and item uh, maybe both address that and even Olin if you have any input? If I understand your question right, you're asking what well, we're concerned about at IDEM, we're concerned, okay, um, is the unit, the landfill itself, leaking? Okay, if the background quality that is not affected by the, by the, by the landfill is showing um, high levels of something, that's a concern general for the drinking water, but for that, for that landfill, which we are regulating, we, in my section, we say, okay, well, the landfill is not causing that, that problem, okay? And the drinking water, maybe there has to be a further concern of the, of, of the water s coming from somewhere else, and that has to be addressed and maybe found out where that water is coming from. But looking at the landfill itself, we're saying the landfill is not affecting the groundwater. So in that respect, we're we're done within our program area. Now we can, we can ask the questions and try to figure out, help figure out where the high levels are coming from somewhere else. But for that landfill itself, we're saying the landfill itself is not causing the problem. So within the, the confines of our regulation, we're, we're not able to do any more. 
and we'll move to a different authority to, 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 to figure out what's going on, and Jim may come into play on that. Um, if we know of a source somewhere else, upgrading of the landfill, just in, in general, any landfill, we may investigate that um, within IDEM, but within the confines of our program area, we're looking at saying, okay, is this landfill causing the problem? In fact, we just had Olin Claussen get up and basically call me a fear monger for saying that. So as you're saying, it's not your responsibility. Local officials are saying it's not their responsibility. Everyone's saying it's not their responsibility. And they're actually accusing me of, of making it up. So I would like to find out whose responsibility is it. I would like you all to decide that amongst yourselves. Thank you. And that's a fair question. So if we, if maybe ELT, IDEM, and Olin and Andy could kind of walk through just generally how we, because I understand that everyone's uh, focused on maybe specific areas, but as a community, we're focused on the entire property. So how do we uh, ensure that the entire property uh, is safe as it relates to our, our water? Um, I don't, well, I'm not, on the water quality around the whole area, um, f for this area, I'm not totally familiar with if the levels that we're seeing are, are levels that are um, of concern, it sounds like from the utility company that they're testing the levels and they haven't seen the levels that are above any kind of concern. So. I'm not quite sure where to go with that. Uh, uh, can you tell, like, what is, what is the source of your data? Uh, you know, we have groundwater monitoring results that we're looking at, and the, and the drinking water branch okay, in IDEM has data. And uh, so uh, help us understand what numbers you're, you're seeing and you where they're coming from. Can I bring you some pictures? Absolutely. Okay, great. monitoring wells that are down at the uh, the landfill and so right here um, this is this is the landfill this is the flash pond here's the the aurora wells and the LMS wells mm -hmm. and you can see these arrows show the flow of water mm -hmm. and this is one of several graphs from that document that show the historical levels going back to when the landfill was open and uh, this is not the best graph it's a print off uh, but the levels show, you know, upwards of 10 ppm of most heavy metals and uh, about 300 ppm to, five, or to 500 ppm of arsenic. Uh, there, there are some levels in there that are really a very big concern, and you can see that the, the way the water flows is from this landfill to the wellhead. Yeah. And it's, it's e whether or not it's coming from that landfill, the fact is that it's, it's showing up, and it's about 1,900 feet away, and the only thing between those, those contaminants and the wellhead is this fly ash pond, mm -hmm. which is why my original suggestion was to do some, some ground testing between here and there and figure out how close they actually were. And so I guess that to, to go back to my original question okay. is whose responsibility is it to deal with this? When you say how close they actually were, what I didn't understand that. So, so this, is, this is testing done in the monitoring wells. Uh -huh. The wells are stationary, but the water is flowing. Yeah. So, and we see the levels changing. So these contaminants are, are on the move. And we know from here to here, that's, that's a five-year travel time. It's about that far. Okay. And this is about half as close as that. But there is a, there is a fly ash pond in the way with, with uh, clay that can slow things down and, and some liners. So what we don't know as a community is whether these contaminants are going around, under, through, yeah. or what. So, so these contaminants are dangerously close to the wellhead and and i've been attempting repeatedly to get someone to take me seriously on this and everyone keeps telling me that it's not their responsibility okay. i was more than happy to accept that responsibility so we do we do know that the groundwater level is below the fly ash pond so the fly ash pond is incised into the ground it's cut into the ground um, and we know that the actual groundwater is below that waste so when we've got water flowing um, from underneath the restricted waste site landfill or even beyond and then under the fly ash pond it is going under the fly ash pond yeah absolutely okay Matt 
looking at your drawing and looking at the constituent list you're, you've got on this graph, the levels I'm seeing on the graph, if I understand the graph correctly, they're not actionable levels to say we've got a major problem, okay? I mean, they're being detected. Some of these constituents are being detected, but also understand that these levels aren't at that level that we say we have to clean up the groundwater, okay? Now that I have an understanding of what your, your diagram is showing, okay, when the groundwater monitoring system goes into place at the, at the fly ash pond, okay, and it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a system that we're gonna evaluate and we're gonna, looking at the closure plan, they're probably gonna have to put in more wells, okay? When that happens, they get the wells, they get the testing. If they have problems with those wells from that diagram, from, from the diagram you're showing me, if they have problems, it will be our responsibility to deal with that issue. Okay, right now we do not have as many wells as we need around the fly ash pond. It's just the way that the situation's worked over the 40 years, however long this ash pond's been here. Now we're getting this, this ash pond up to speed with the monitoring, okay? And we put the wells in, we find out there's a problem, we deal with it, okay? So if you're asking who's gonna deal with it, we will deal with that. If there are actionable levels where we feel like um, through the statistics and, and uh, the federal drinking water standards, if there's a problem, we will deal with that problem and we'll come up with a solution um, to fix it. Right now, with, uh, with your um, utilities, they don't see a problem at the wells that they're testing uh, from what they've said, okay? So, but we will be dealing with it based on your pictures once we get the monitoring system in. Does that help? Thank you. Right. Thank you, Matt. I can't respond to those concerns, but point out that yeah. there is no, that the, that the, the utility is responsible for those wells that are not here uh, for speaking today. Uh, I don't see one who's pointing any wells. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'll do that. Well, so those levels are above the drinking water standards, especially 10 ppm of vanadium and lead. And I don't see uh, how you're going to address those concerns when Aurora does not have a treatment facility and cannot put one there. One thing I'd like for everybody here to understand, I know there's been a lot of discussion about contaminants and monitoring wells and results and everything else. Uh, your drinking water providers uh, have people here tonight, and from what they've indicated, there is no, no hits, no concern, nothing in exceedance in the water that you are currently receiving at your tap, okay? We, the, this, there's discussion about some monitoring wells that aren't related to that. And, and I know a lot of people, as, as was referred to, the elderly and whatnot are calling up and things like that. I just want everybody in this room to tell their friends and everybody else in town to understand that their water is perfectly safe to drink. Um, and, and that these impoundments have been in place for a long time, there hasn't been any change, and that there has been no effect to the drink water, it's still clean to drink. And that when these capping systems and these monitoring systems are in place, there will be further protections to continue to ensure that your drinking water is still clean to drink. My name's Chris Muller, um, and I drink the water down here, <laughs> and I like it. But I would, and I, I actually, my concern is not so much with what people think is happening right now. My concern is what do you do if you find a problem in one of these monitoring wells? What is the solution to that? Because with our water's coming from underground aquifers. If you contaminate the underground aquifer with arsenic, for example, I don't know how you get that out of the aquifer. I think when I talked to one of your geologists up there, they told me that what ends up happening is that you have to then treat it at the water treatment plant, which at that point becomes an issue. It's post-treatment. So we have then contaminated our supply forever at that point. So my question to you is what happens if arsenic does get to our groundwater supply? If it, if arsenic, if, if it's detected in the wells, <laughs> there could be, one solution would be that they, they basically have to pump the water there at the fly ash pond. Um, and they suck the water up and they treat the water before it gets to the utility company. 
okay? It's a pump and treat, it's called pump and treat system. Um, and that's one of the more uh, common ways of fixing a problem like that. Um, and that's, that, that could go on forever. I mean, they would be, the company that has, who's responsible for the landfill um, or the fly ash pond, they would be the ones that would be responsible for that as long as, as long as there's a problem, okay? It's, it's called corrective action, groundwater corrective action. And that's one solution. Another solution, you know, another solution, they put a slurry wall around the thing. A big giant mud wall, they just encircle the big old mud wall and, and it's contained. It can't get through the mud wall. So that would be another, that would be super expensive, especially in this type of geologic environment where you got a lot of sand, but it could be done. Up in, up in Indianapolis, they have a slurry wall around that landfill because um, they have problems. So that's another corrective measure that can happen. Um, the, the facility would be responsible to investigate the different ways to correct the problem. We would look at that problem and we would say, okay, we agree, this is probably the best way to correct that problem. Okay, it wouldn't be done like in an instant, but it would be done uh, fairly quickly and it may be that the company, whoever, whoever's responsible for the fly ash pond or the landfill, they would be responsible for supplying water to the, uh, to the, to the people if need be. <coughs> okay, that'd be part of the corrective action process. So um, I'm not sure which geologist you talked to or what if, if they had the full understanding of what you're asking. Um, they so. Did. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Uh huh. We had discussed the problem, you know, with, with the fly ash pond that did have liners and the age of the liners that were in there in place and also the clay wall. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. but, but we would look at it and we would be um, taking care of the best that we know how. Um, I'll let, I'll let yeah, Jim talk. Over here. Um, I, I, I Hi. Um, my name is Pam. And we keep talking about the fly ash, but there's another thing that I want to talk about. The stuff that you're burying on the ground, the stuff that's not ferrous or non-ferrous metals, the stuff that you can't sell off for, you know, that you're burying there. Is that being tested for things like the asbestos, you said, or lead, things of that nature? Because I was at a town council meeting in Dillsboro, and we were told that i and had to take the asbestos out before they ever vacated. Is that true? Was there some sort of something in place to, to move most of the asbestos before they? No, that would, when we took over the plant, it, it's our obligation to remove all the asbestos. And that was mostly taken out at first? That was all taken out prior to any demolition okay. work, yes. But now there's basements there that this, the asbestos was not taken out of? No, that's not correct. That's that's okay, because in the meeting I went to. abatement of the entire facility. And I, I, Matt, was that not what we heard at Dillsboro? <coughs> that some of the, the, the materials in the basement were never touched? Yes, according to the former ADP employee, nothing was removed from the basement, everything was left in place. Correct, which, I mean, there, it, it, are, we, are we guaranteed there's not lead, there's not asbestos? Because our water is fine today, but what about 10, 15 years from now? What, what can you guarantee us? That's my concern. Let, let, me, let me take that apart in some pieces. The, the, it is, the asbestos was removed from the entire facility, from the lower basements to the very top. Uh, that, that was a complete abatement. The ba we, are, we are not through with the, with the demolition process. We still have work to do to clean out the basements, but, but prior to any type of demolition, all the materials, all the universal waste we talked about, all the oil and greases, all the sumps, all those material, all those areas were cleaned. So all of that environmental clean, cleanup work, if you were, was done prior to demolition. There is today, everybody, we're not done with the demolition. That's obvious. We still have work ahead of us to go in and, and remove and finish the work in the basements to, to finish the, to do the cleanup work for the demolition. And who monitors what you're burying in the ground? I don't assume IDEM does that, correct? That's, to a certain extent, I mean, that IDEM can come in and, and can monitor what we're doing. Again, we, we take the position that concrete and brick is clean, un, you know, uncontaminated material that is best reused for the refill, for the 
for filling and, and again within the basement structures for filling some of those basement structures that's that's a common demolition practice that's done throughout the u.s to try to reuse those materials it's and no different than the it's the concrete foundations that were in the ground to begin with right if you think about it it's it's the cut we're, we're breaking up the concrete foundations that were in the ground to begin with as part of the demolition process but you're not i mean there's no lead that we have to worry about anything lead based anything I, I mean those are the things that concern me you know down the road so the, the waste that is buried is waste that does not contain um, in particular lead let's talk about lead uh, sometimes brick and concrete are not allowed to be buried on site if they mm -hmm. have uh, paint that has lead correct in it. that was okay. that was my concern okay. and, and that those wastes are taken off site um, the, the, what we reuse is what is considered clean uh, uh, construction and demolition waste, clean C and D fill. It's called different things in different states. The, the standards sometimes vary, but they're pretty much consistent. And what we what we reuse is clean brick and concrete. Concrete is made of nothing more than rock that's been baked and mixed with some more rock and water, and bricks nothing more than mud. So we're just crushing it up and putting it back, which is why Russ has brought up that it's just as good as using virgin soil or, or virgin rock, except for it's on site, so you save the truck traffic and you have material there to fill in the basement holes, the voids that are left after you're done with the demolition, because when you're done, we want a level site so we can bring in most likely the ports and, and create a port or whatever other <laughs> development takes place there. And I understand that, but my, I mean, I'm just saying, is there anybody monitoring that like, other than you, under, other than Tanner's Creek LLC? Is the inspections for the demolition permit? That's probably a question for IDEM. Is it, are, you, are you guys monitoring what they're burying in the ground? So our solid waste compliance inspectors um, would be the people who could come out, um, especially if we received a complaint to to look at what they're at what they're doing, um, we haven't received any complaints to this point um, about materials, you know, being managed inappropriately there. Um, the authorities we're looking at right now revolve around closure of of the fly ash pond, the main ash pond, and the restricted waste site landfill. The redevelopment of that area where the power plant buildings has been, there may be some work with some of our other programs that address remediation. Um, they, we asked if they would be able to come with us tonight and they were unavailable. Um, but uh, I'm not sure you know, what plan's being done there. So if, if there are known problems, we can share those with um, our compliance inspectors and they can come out um, and take a look and see if they, um, find violations and, and pursue that. And right. So, so if you have information, I, you know, you we're talking about a former employee that had suspicions. You know, that person um, can submit a complaint to us and we can follow up on that. Um, there are buildings being demolished. I guess a couple of things. The asbestos abatement is managed within our Office of Air Quality. And you know, so they had to go through a process there, um, and the we have buildings being demolished all over the state. Um, we do our best to monitor um, what's going on, but we certainly can't go in and inspect every every building that's being demolished. So I think you do need to consider the location of those um, of that facility in relation to your groundwater or drinking water wells. Uh, where that is, we've got a creek underneath it. it there's a long time of travel there. Um, I don't think I don't see a lot of concern there. Just kind of just thinking through that. And going back to, and that brings up two good things. That one, uh, that we did discuss that there are demolition inspections and there are inspections that occur surrounding the demolition. Is that correct? Or maybe ELT could speak to that. Um, and then the other one is just a general uh, point that I think is important and I think that this group really gets that. But anytime, you know, see something, say something. Anytime anyone 
uh, has a concern, and uh, Rebecca will uh, sign on to this point, call IDEM, um, email IDEM. Uh, you can even, Brian DeBuehler, uh, encourage people to reach out to the Army Corps of Engineers during some, a permitting phase. So, uh, and also your local officials, always reach out, um, even if it's something that uh, you're not 100% sure has validity. Um, I, we've never reached out to IDEM and been greeted with anything other than uh, taking it very seriously and taking action. So please do that. And then ELT, uh, if, if you could speak to just what, how, how that demo process is inspected. I know we talked about it a little bit before, but I think they bring up a good question. Uh, prior to demolition, there's inspections done uh, by <laughs> independent um, consultants and contractors that we have no affiliation with whatsoever. Uh, for hazardous uh, waste inventory. Um, typically, they look for uh, PCB containing materials, heavy metal containing materials, most particularly ACM or asbestos containing materials. Uh, they make a long report and list of that, and those are the items that have to be taken out, uh, as Russ said, prior to demolition. So those, those items are all uh, tested. They're, they're, they're samples pulled, sent off to a laboratory, they're checked for whatever they may contain. If they're suspect, they're tested. And many times those tests come back negative. The ones that come back positive are inventoried and they're removed prior to demolition. That's done on pretty much every commercial industrial demolition project there is, um, especially the older sites like we have here. Um, so that's very typical. Uh, in conjunction with that, we've had many um, agencies and, and interested parties do their own inspections and we haven't had um, those concerns come up because we always address those concerns with the, the uh, lead painted materials and things like that and the asbestos abatement is, is documented and there's reports and inspections done with that as well. Thank you. We have a question over here. I'm Tim Seacrest. I'm from Aurora. Uh, so we'd be mostly affected I believe because the water flows downstream and Aurora and a lot of other little towns get their water from those wells. Uh, my question is, like Lady said over here, 10 or 15 years down the line, we had or, uh, arsenic or something in the water. Who pays for that? If, if it is shown that the source of the contamination is one of the ash impoundments or the landfill, which will be constantly monitored through these wells, then we would be responsible for cleaning that up. Okay. But I would like to also add, these wells are positioned so that they have what they call early detection. So if there is a leak, it will be detected long before it reaches your water supply. Are you bonded or will there be a bond? Uh, who would be responsible for that 10, 15 years down the line? Uh, depending upon the closure process, there is a financial insurance mechanism put into place. That financial insurance mechanism remains through the closure period. Uh, that can be in the form of a trust or a bond or you can put up cash. Uh, there are many ways to do that, but there is a required financial assurance mechanism. What would that require? Would that require a lot of deep wells going through a filter? Uh, it, 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 it's enough. What would take the heavy metals out? Okay, so what would it require to clean the water? That is very dependent upon the situation. That's a very hypothetical situation. I, as was referred to, if that situation should occur, then we would have to have a uh, engineering analysis and design done for a cleanup approach. There are many different ways to clean that up. There are many different ways to treat water for heavy metals. Uh, we would have to, at that time, find out what would be most effective. Let me, I just wanted to just follow up briefly on, on, on what was just mentioned that as part of this closure process and as part of the post-closure closure care obligations, we are required to post what's called financial assurance, and, and that is posted with Indiana Department of Environmental Management. So there's going to be an obligation to post a fund to manage that 30-year post-closure care period. So that just, just to, to kind of reiterate that question from your monitoring and maintenance from a groundwater standpoint, there's an ob we have an obligation to post financial assurance with the state of Indiana. What amount? The amount is determined that there, there's a mechanism in place and that's all part of the closure plans and the post-closure care. Okay. There's a mechanism. It's all pretty expensive if you have to go to 
Well, the water treatment would be a corrective action would be a, a, another step, but again, that's hypothetical that that would have to go you know, to get into that place. But just for, for you were, there is a financial assurance mechanism that, that will be in place. I have a question. Sorry, I didn't realize that mic was that hot. <laughs> uh, mean to over talk there. Um, I've spoken with uh, Tim Maloney at HEC um, quite frequently uh, in matters in the past. And uh, I'm looking at their, uh, it was released March 13th, 2018. It was kind of uh, a study they had done on a lot of the different power plants uh, in the state of Indiana. And one thing that I noticed, and I, I had talked at a, at a previous city council meeting uh, before, and I brought this question up, and nobody really had the answer. Um, has, there, has the materials at this site ever been tested for radioactivity or radium? Because I'm looking at this list of all these power plants that they tested and, uh, you know, uh, Coley Generating System or Station in Warwick County. Um, there's just a bunch of them here. Uh, uh, Brown Generating Station in West Franklin, IPL Petersburg. Um, there's several in here, but y you do see uh, radium popping up at some of these sites. And I was just curious if any of the materials here locally have ever been tested for radioactivity? <laughs> Do you want to try that? <laughs> yeah, but John, I don't think we're going to. Uh, the materials, I don't think that I know of haven't. Um, I can't, we don't, our waste analysis group. Uh, when they do a waste classification, I don't think that's part of the waste classification testing for the materials. Right. Now the groundwater will be tested for um, radium and such. That, so uh, the, that's ground, one the groundwater monitoring wells would, would show that? If it's in the groundwater and they're using the proper testing methods to analyze the groundwater for that particular constituent, yes. Okay, because um, I, I, I mean, I wasn't seeing it in the historical testing, but I didn't know if that was because it wasn't there or because it hadn't been tested for that. And then when I looked at that report from Hoosier Environmental Council, and I, it seemed to be kind of a recurring theme at some of the other plants around the state and I didn't know how does that get there is that radium is that in the coal originally or where does it come from I mean because it's obviously not a nuclear facility um, wh right. what is the source of that radium right. that they're it finding be, at these stations it could be part of the coal the burn um, on this particular site for the groundwater it hasn't been tested yet this is the radium testing is, is part of the federal regulations the 2015. Um, and right. I know that I know this plant was exempted from that because they closed in 2014. That's correct. But but on their sampling list, that's part of the closure plan. They are they are proposing to test for that, for that constituent. Okay. So they they will be testing for it. The materials I mean, themselves, I have no idea if they've tested the materials for that. I mean, out of all the bad not. stuff there, that's kind of you know the one that rings a bell with everybody. I know boron is can be an issue yes. and we've talked about that. I know uh, Olin was speaking about that earlier with regard to, I know there's not a, the Safe Drinking Water Act doesn't establish a safe level for boron, but the World Health Organization does. I mean, are there any plans going forward for IDEM to, I mean, can't we be, wouldn't it be a good idea to be kind of forward thinking with that uh, testing? We do test for radium. You do test for radium? Okay, I, I was, well, thanks. I've been asking that for a lot. I should have just called you. <laughs> yeah, and, r and real quick on your question on boron. Sure. That w that's part of their sampling, their, their <coughs> sampling um, sure. constituent list, and they will be testing it, and we'll be looking at it, and if there is a problem with boron over what, what, is, what, what is considered background, there may be a need that they have to address that issue. Okay. Okay. I, mean, I know we have testing standards I just you know if other places in the world are saying hey this is bad and our standards are older or established a long time ago we could get it up to speed yeah we'll be looking at it Thanks. Uh, we have Aurora utilities here also Randy Turner from Aurora uh, just wanted to speak on behalf of Aurora and LMS uh, I started in 1979 at the city and prior to that uh, we were lucky enough to have a engineer from Sigrams that was on our planning commission when this uh, ash pond, the big one that's getting ready to be capped, uh, was being developed. 
and he sounded the alarm, and that action at that resulted in a monitoring agreement between AEP and the city of Aurora, which is still being continued. I'm glad to hear that uh, LLC will be taking care of the where the power plant was, but AEP has assured us that they will continue to monitor uh, our water. Uh, while we have had a, uh, a detect on the boron, um, there's no evidence that it's at an unsafe level. Um, so we will continue that monitoring. Uh, one thing that I'm really impressed about tonight that items here, the LLC, Lawrenceburg, the citizens, Matt, even you for questioning all this. This is good because this water is one of the best assets of our area. And this is the kind of attention that something like this needs. And I'm like I say, I'm really impressed. Uh, we've had our wellhead protection plan, which started uh, probably 15 to 20 years ago, and we do uh, promotions and that, but we haven't had anything reach out to as many people as what this has. So I applaud all of you. This, this is something great. It needs to be watched, and uh, if things do deteriorate in the future, uh, we still have a fantastic resource behind us in the Ohio River. And I can tell you that the Cincinnati Water Works, they have one of the premier water plants in the nation, and that's where they take that water out of the Ohio River and look at all the people that they're providing water for. Uh, here, like I say, we've got an aquifer. It doesn't just stop with I&M. You go up the river, the Gulf refinery, everything, all the way, the major corridor right along the river. So there's numerous avenues and all this protection and this forethought that is going into watching this resource, it's fantastic. And it, it should never end as it's something that we have to take care of. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who came out today. Um, I think the most important thing that Randy said is to point out um, that this is a collaboration. This will always remain a collaboration. Um, it always starts with you, the citizens of Lawrenceburg, you, the citizens of Dearborn County. Um, we are here to represent you, to protect you, to put forward your concerns. And that was our goal tonight. That's the limited power that we have. But we will exercise that vigorously. We've done that in the past and we'll continue to do that. So I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, you guys drive home safely. And uh, this doesn't end here. We will continue to protect our water.